The 40th anniversary of the Craft Council of BC is coming up in October. That means a spectacular display of the creative works of our local craft makers. This is not to be missed. Check out the ad in our program. Our next guest had her life changed when a grade six teacher introduced her to textile art. She is devoted to the relationship between textile and narrative. How textile can tell a story has made her the subject of three national film board documentaries. Please welcome Bettina Matskun. Thank you, Sam and Lynn, and thank you to your behind-the-scenes people. I wanted to tell you about a pilgrimage I made last summer. Since embroidery is my métier, I've long wanted to see the Bayou Tapestry in, in northern France. The tapestry is a richly colored embroidery. It's only about 50 centimeters high, but it's 70 meters long. That's as long as an average Vancouver city block. It features over 600 characters, so like a graphic novel, it has pathos and action and humor and captions in Latin. It's almost a thousand years old, and most textiles don't live that long. Scholars like to argue about who made it. The French, the English. But they agree that it was hung in the Bayou Cathedral once a year, inside and then otherwise was kept in a vault. The cathedral was devastated by fire in the 1070s, but the tapestry was safe down there. And then in the 1500s, Huguenots rampaged through Bayou, destroying everything remotely Catholic and opulent. They hacked the stone figures off the front of the cathedral and smashed windows, but the tapestry was safe. Until the 1790s and the French Revolution, when it was confiscated to be cut up for wagon coverings. So enter Monsieur Leonard Le Forestier, and he sounds like a hulking hockey player, but he was a town councillor. <laughs> and he stepped up and saved it. It survived the rapacious Nazis. Today, the Bayou Tapestry is on the memory of the World Heritage List. And as a tourist, you go down there and you get headphones in any language of your choice and you're herded through as it tells you the story in your headphones. So I did that and then took off the headphones and just looked at it. In practicing hands-on craft, you have a very direct link with the people who've practiced the same thing in the past. I may have a different color selection of thread and shinier needles, but, and certainly better lighting to work by. But I have that same feeling of pulling the thread through the cloth and watching the image grow and trying ever so slowly to say something. Crafts people use their materials to tell their stories. So, the story, in a nutshell. Harold, a British earl, goes to Normandy to visit William, who's in line for the English throne when old King Edward dies. And Harold swears on this religious relic that when William is crowned king, he will be his loyal servant. Harold goes home to England, and old King Edward dies. How's your Latin? Defunctus est. <laughs> and then Harold promptly crowns himself king. Yo, Harold, dude, that is so not a good move. Outside, his people are pointing at the Halley's Comet sailing by, trailing flames like an old hot rod. It's a bad omen, Harold. William, of course, in Normandy gets wind of this, and he builds ships and invades England and routes them all in the Battle of Hastings, 1066, and Harold is, well, Harold is toast. In this great sweeping saga, there's many, many details, and embroidery is necessarily about details. So, of course, I love all the little fingers pointing at the comet, and this bird playfully pecking a soldier on his metal helmet, bing bing. This naked couple running towards each other, they may be glad to see each other, or maybe it's another sort of epic battle. <laughs> lion-like dogs and dog-like lions. 
surprisingly familiar greyhounds. I love this peevish duke holding out his keys on the end of his lance. All right, you can have the keys. <laughs> it's like something out of Monty Python. <laughs> this monk with his nicely shaven tonsure and his super stubbly chin. The boys with their lovely white thighs waiting in the water to tie up the ships. <laughs> the weight of the chain mail as they carry it to the ships and load it up, and then, of course, they have to unload it, too. The glee of the horses as they get out of the boats after the cramped crossing on the English Channel. The shipwrights using their very specific tools. And you can see the pain on old King Edward's face as he lies dying. This is the days before prescription opiates. Of course, there are great long extended scenes of warfare, meters of warfare, followed pretty closely thereafter by great extended scenes of how horribly men and horses die in battle. The figure on the right is Harold and he's trying to pull an arrow out of his eye. Apparently, that's the symbolic death for perjurers. In the border, which carries so much extra information, there are people salvaging the chain mail off the bodies and leaving the corpses as carrion. This man, unarmed, is about to be beheaded. He has snot running from his nose. And a thousand years later, his fear is palpable. In fact, the last few meters of the tapestry are just strewn with body parts. Usually we think of embroidery as home sweet home and flowers on little tablecloths. <laughs> but here it's dealing with carnage. And the scene that sticks with me the most is this one. As the rampaging army crosses England, two men set a house on fire, and underneath the burning roof is a woman with her son. She's holding her hand out, pleading. Whoever embroidered her understood her terrible vulnerability and uncertainty. She's a woman in present-day Syria, in Darfur, Afghanistan, Bosnia. She's my grandmother with my dad. She's probably your grandmother. She's our lady of collateral damage. I guess my great admiration for this bit of needlework extends to the arts in general and to those who protect the arts. Monsieur Leonard Le Forestier is a big all-star in my league. The arts, whether it's the materiality of craft such as this, to the most ephemeral performance, the arts are what tell our stories. Thank you.